dumb questions, there's just dumb people, right? Right? There are no dumb questions, there's just dumb people. Now, you may have heard that spoken about somebody, or you may have heard that spoken about you. I know I've probably said some pretty, I'm said some pretty, some questions that people think are pretty dumb, and in turn they think I'm dumb. When in, our, in our reading from Mark chapter 4 today, the disciples' question seems a little dumb. Actually, in fact, as we read about the disciples throughout the New Testament, we might begin to think that their questions aren't so dumb. In fact, they're a little dumb. The God of the universe was in the boat with them, asleep, fast asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat, and yet they were panicking that they were going to drown. The God of the universe. You begin to think that the question isn't so dumb, and the people are a little dumb. That's the impression we get about the disciples as we read the New Testament. That these men, these men who experience the mighty teachings and works of Jesus are just, man, they're a little dumb. They don't, they don't get it. They don't get that all of these teachings, all of these miracles are leading up uh, to, to reveal who this person in this boat was and is still today. There aren't dumb questions they're just dumb people. We all know that. We all know somebody who we could label as a, as a dumb person. Maybe you label yourself as a, as a dumb person. I'm, I'm blessed with some pretty great parents. Many of you have had the opportunity to meet them, as my dad was here to, to preach for me, um, to preach to you, to bring God's word to you. And I know that. I know not everybody has had positive relationships with their parents. And, and I know that I am, I am, I'm blessed to have two parents who remind me of two very important things. We love you, and Jesus loves you. Throughout my entire life, that is the refrain that my parents spoke to me. We love you, and Jesus loves you. I was blessed to have that refrain spoken throughout my life. In fact, still today, my parents proclaim that refrain to me. As my mom texted me this morning, as she has every single Sunday morning, even when I'm not preaching, may God be with you, Stephen. Heart emoji. <laughs> my mom loves emojis. My dad, not so much. But he does remind me in his own way with weird Android gifts and weird pictures of things. But, but my parents consistently remind me that they love me and that Jesus loves me. And yet, yet there's times that I doubt it. As I struggled with school because academics weren't my strongest suit, as I struggled with school and they made me do my homework and they, they checked my grades, I wondered if they cared. I doubted their love for me in those moments. As I struggled with, with friendships and, and relationships and they, they walked alongside me in that and just didn't seem to give me exactly what I needed in those times and places, I doubted whether they loved me and cared for me. The context of our reading uh, comes from this, this, this beautiful stretch of parable teaching of Jesus, where he reminds the, the disciples and he proclaims to the disciples and the people around him what the kingdom of God was like. The kingdom of God was like, like a, a master who went out to sow some seed graciously everywhere. Or the kingdom of God was like a, a mustard seed or... or um, like a, like a lamp under a basket. It was this beautiful thing that was about to explode in the world, and it would start with the gracious work of Jesus. They got to witness miracles and the proclamation of forgiveness to a, a paralegic who would also then be here, healed of his paralysis. 
They got to see and hear the mighty works of God in the flesh. And then in a boat, in the midst of a storm, it all went away. It all went away, and they feared if this teacher of theirs, this Jesus, actually cared. Verse 38, teacher, do you care that we are perishing? Do you care? How quickly they forgot, and how quickly I forget. How quickly I forget that that my parents actually love me, even in the midst of my struggle when I can't quite see it. They're still there, speaking that refrain, we love you and Jesus loves you. And how quickly I forget how much Jesus cares, how much God cares and God loves me. In fact, uh, this, this seemingly dumb question of the disciples doesn't seem so dumb to me once I think about it because it's a question that I need answering every single day because it's a question that I ask every single day. God, do you care that I'm perishing? Do you care that I'm struggling? I'm thankful that the disciples asked this seemingly dumb question. And in fact, now that I think about it, it's not, they're not so dumb because they're asking the same question I'm asking. God, do you care? I need the answer to that question. You need the answer to that question. The world needs the answer to that question question. What you don't need is an allegory. You don't need an allegory. You don't need to be told that that Jesus will calm the storms of your life. Good luck. What you need is an answer. What I need is an answer to that question. And so as we read this text, a text that many of us are familiar with, we don't want to allegorize it. We don't want to turn it into something where it's like, all the storms of life, Jesus will save us. Because that's not what this is about. Jesus, in fact, gives us a better answer to the question. He speaks his word. He speaks his authoritative, powerful word, the same word that created all things. The same word spoken at creation that that created all things, that same word is spoken here at the sea. As the sea goes from violent to completely calm. Not a a gradual calm, not not an eventual calm. He doesn't have to repeat it multiple times like my parents have to do to me. He speaks it and it's done. Calm, completely, like glass. It's that word, that word of God that we need. We don't only need to hear it, we need to see it. And we do. Because uh, Jesus doesn't speak here. He speaks another three words, not peace be still, but it is finished when he's hanging from a cross. And it's at that moment. It's at that moment that the chaos of death and sin that rules your life and mine is done. It's finished. It's calm. And it's with the word of Jesus that we hear in this text and we hear on the cross that we see that our God cares. He cares that you're perishing. That's exactly why he came. That's exactly why he came. To answer this very question, do you care that we're perishing? Yes, in fact, he does, but not just 2,000 years ago. He still cares today. He cares that that you're perishing from from needing to accomplish and, and find value in your job by showing you that you're enough in who he's created you to be. That that the check that you get in your bank account or in the mail or is handed to you on a 
the, the 15th and 30th of every Sunday? Like me? Does it mark my value as a person? As his creation? In fact, all the things he's given me as a, as a son and a, and a brother and a, and a pastor and a friend and a, and a neighbor all add more value than a paycheck to my life. As I'm perishing in broken relationships and friendships, he comes along and gives me a word to speak, a word of confession and a word of forgiveness to restore those, those perishing relationships. As I'm perishing, trying to, trying to find an identity and grasp something and put something together that the, that the world is teaching me I have to do, I have to form this identity. He speaks one to you. He gives one to you as his child. He sees that you're perishing in who you are, and he tells you who you are. He sees that you're perishing in, in regret and shame, a, a mountain of it that just seems to never go away. He sees that even now, and he speaks a word of forgiveness that just like here, peace be still, it takes it away. And he doesn't see it anymore. His powerful word, his powerful word is the answer to that question. Do you not care that we're perishing? And he says with an emphatic, yes. And it is finished. Peace. Be still. Jesus cares. He does. And he answered it when he calmed the storm here. And he answered it when he said it is finished on the cross. And he answered it about Ten minutes ago, when you heard his words of forgiveness can't come through my mouth, he continually, daily reminds you that he cares. And he daily and, and hourly gives you that restoration and rescue from your perishing soul and heart and body. The interesting thing about Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, is it's a transition text. Uh, you know, the, the writers of the Gospels wrote things in a particular order to tell and reveal a certain thing about Jesus. And this is a transition part of the text from one thing to the next. To reveal one part of Jesus' mission to the next part of Jesus' work and mission. Jesus is going from one side of a sea to another side of a sea. From the Jewish side of the sea to the Gentile side of a sea. From those who were considered insiders to those who were considered extreme outsiders. Jesus and his disciples make their way across this seemingly small but very violent sea. And Jesus reveals in this moment that he doesn't just care for God's, God's chosen people. He cares for all people, whether they are a part of God's family yet or not yet. He cares for everybody, and he cares that everybody is perishing. He cares about that. And in this text, that's what's revealed he doesn't just care about the disciples. He cares about the people to which he is, he is going. In these few verses, in this transition text of Scripture, moving from one side of a lake to another side of a lake, which seems insignificant to us, Jesus is proclaiming that he cares for all people. And in fact, the words of John 10.10 10 are meant not just for you and me, but for everybody we meet. And these are his words. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I, I came that all of them, that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus knows we're perishing, and he's given us life. So the answer to the disciples' question Jesus, do you care? The answer to our question, Jesus, God, do you care that we're perishing? Yes. And he's done something about it. 
because when he walked out of that tomb, he gave us life, eternal life, and so we're no longer perishing. We have eternal life with him no matter what. Following Jesus is is following in the wake of what he's done and what he continues to do. And and that's, that's something that I've been asking myself as we've entered into these conversations between resurrection and St. Mark about what it means for us to follow Jesus. What, it mean, what does it mean for us to be his church? To live as if though we are not perishing, we have life sent to those who are perishing, who, who need this life that Jesus desires to give them. And I go back to Matthew 28 very end. Some of you know it by heart. Some of you may have never heard it. It says this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching teaching them everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He says these words, He gives these words to us as we follow him, not only because he cares for us, but because he cares for the people we're being sent to. Because he cares for your family members who aren't yet a part of this family. Because he cares for your neighbors who are are perishing in their work and their regret, their shame, their crafted identity, their relationships. He cares. And he desires them to experience the life that he's given you and the life that he desires to give them. And so he sends us into the world with that same caring heart that he has for you and me, that we also have through the power of the Holy Spirit for those in our lives. Jesus cares that you're perishing. And in fact, he's given you life. And he cares that your neighbors are perishing. And he desires to give them life through you. And so we follow Jesus, living in the wake of what he's done for us and continues to do for us and even now continues to do through us. It's in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen.